uh, on behalf of the Navasing Maritime Heritage Association, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation. My name is Steven Schwankert. I am the Deputy Program Coordinator for the association. Um, a lot of you here tonight are members. Thank you very much for your membership and welcome. And to those of you who are, who are non-members, please consider becoming a member. It really supports the work that we do, the preservation work, the historical work, and also it supports presentations like this so that we're able to offer it to you and members of the community for free. Also welcome to everyone who's joining us on Zoom. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Please, uh, if you're here in the room at Monmouth Boat Club, please put your phones on silent or vibrate or just something that won't make a sound. Um, we have a couple of programs coming up that we think you'll enjoy. There's Weekend at Old Monmouth, which is the first weekend of May. Um, we are on the Blue Route, yes? Yeah. Yes, we are on the Blue Route, but you can come. You don't have to participate in any route. The lovely thing about Weekend at Old Monmouth is that you can kind of do it any way you like. Uh, you can just come to Grover House. Um, we'll have some refreshments. We'll give you a tour of the house. We'll get to see some of the work that we've done on its preservation. And uh, yeah, come on by. It's, it's, it's always a lovely weekend. It's also a great time to explore Monmouth County history. Um, so it's really, it's really up to you. That's on uh, our, our, if you want to pick up a flyer for um, Grover House, it's on the table on your way out. Also coming up this summer, we have our River Monmouth Boat Club is all, thank you. Monmouth Boat Club is also on the history tour, so be sure to stop here as well. Um, we also have these, the, our summer River Rangers up in July and August. Uh, if you have a 10 to 14 year old in your life who would enjoy swimming, paddling, canoeing, water safety, discovering wildlife, discovering the area, uh, please pick up one of these flyers on the way out. Uh, registration is filling up and uh, now would be a good time to, to get, get that locked in for the summer. So those flyers are available at the, uh, towards the, at the table towards the entrance. So it's my pleasure to introduce John Barrows, who is the editor of Monmouth Timeline. Uh, he's going to give us the presentation about the land wreckers and I'm going to turn it over directly to John Barrows. Please welcome John. Sorry, just a moment. We're good to go. Thank you, Thank you Steve. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out here today. My name is John Barrows and I am editor of Monmouth Timeline. Um, <clears throat> I am originally from Eastern Massachusetts. So I grew up in a history rich part of the world. Um, and I have, my wife and I have been living in Little Silver for the past 30 years uh, and have absolutely loved it. We actually came to New Jersey to get our careers together so we could go back to Denver. We've never looked back. We've stayed here ever since and have absolutely fallen in love with the area. Um, for most of my career, I worked up in Morris County um, as in corporate communications for companies like uh, this and Nabisco. And uh, so for 25 years, I was living in Monmouth County, but hardly spent any time here. Um, but I retired in 2016 and began doing volunteer work uh, for some of the different organizations and was just absolutely blown away by how little I knew about the history of this area and just how incredibly deep and rich that history is. And uh, eventually I realized that there was no one place where all these incredible stories uh, came together. So that's why in uh, 2000, I launched mammothtimeline.org. And uh, that's a website that presents the illustrated history of Monmouth County. Can you hear me in the back with my voice at this level? Because I can collect it up if I have to. Don't think I won't. So it's a website. Um, it's, uh, it has 
25 different categories, everything from um, crime, science, women's history, black history. But uh, one of the most popular categories um, is ships and shipwrecks. Um, every day, the site features what happened on that day. Not every, there's not a, we don't have something for every single day. What we have, what we'd like to try and do is have everything important um, map to uh, and, uh, the uh, calendar. And then um, we have a bunch of featured stories uh, that are written by leading historians um, from the region, such as Rick Gefkin, Randall Gabrielon, uh, Melissa Ziobro, uh, and some familiar names like that. So let's get to it. Barnegat Pirates are either the worst scoundrels on the face of the earth or they are a much injured set of men right that was a statement made by a new jersey state senator in 1846 not a lot of middle ground there is it we're scoundrels on the face of the earth sounds like a good research question to me that's what we're going to be decide that's what we're going to delve into today so today we're going to look at who or what were the wreckers of Monmouth County? How did they differ from other people who were doing the same thing in other shipwreck prone parts of the world? How did they end up with such a terrible reputation? And then how did the wreckers of Monmouth County influence the formation of the US Coast Guard? So best way to kind of tee up where we are in history here. U.S. Coast Guard came into existence in 1915. 1876, U.S. Life Saving Service. 1878, rather. Um, and then there was the, before that, though, and then there was the Newell Appropriation in 1848. But before that, from 1848 backwards, if your ship was on trouble close to shore, your life depended on wreckers. Now, we're talking about a period of time when it sometimes seems like a miracle that any sailing voyage was ever successfully concluded because there were so many things that could go wrong at sea. And so uh, here's Lloyd's Register of Shipping. And this is one of the older ones that you can, uh, that's accessible. But this gives you an idea that uh, the kinds of things that Lloyd was, Lloyd's was uh, uh, keeping track of. Now, this isn't everything that can go wrong in a boat. This is everything that goes wrong in a boat so often Lloyd's that he keep track of it. Foundered, missing, broken up, condemned, burnt, collision, thank you, <laughs> wrecked, lost, etc. What does the etc mean? War losses. So, what we're really talking about here is shore based marine rescue and salvage. Now, those are very separate entities today. Um, but they were, they were basically one thing in this era pre-1848. So it's kind of important to just maybe take a little bit of a look about what, what, is, what are we talking about when we say marine salvage? It's pretty much it's a system that's been in place for the, for the entire era of sail. Um, it, it is usually, marine salvage is usually guaranteed by a different set of laws than the laws that guarantee such things on land. The idea is that in, in, in a situation where something has gone horribly wrong, there's a, a, a path forward where everybody gets the best possible solution and outcome they can under the circumstances. And it, it recognizes that there are actually different rules in some parts of the world, different states, different places for different kinds of things. So uh, different rules about uh, things like flotsam, which is the stuff that's floating and jetsam, which is the stuff that washes ashore. And we all know with that. But a lot of people don't know there's a third one, lagging. Um, that's the stuff that lies on the ocean floor. And when you think about all the treasure from Spanish ships that lies on the, on the, on the uh, ocean floor, that is a significant aspect of, of wreckers and marine salvage. So the idea of, of, of the, uh, the wreckers approach was that it was supposed to be a mutually beneficial arrangement. Your ship is in serious trouble. Volunteers from shore offer assistance. The first priority, save lives. Second, save cargo, save the valuable stuff. And third, oh, all right, we missed third. Third, save the ship if possible. 
you as the ship owner and master, whatever, you avoid total loss and uh, of life and damage. And then those people who have helped you get a little something, something out of it. At least that's how it's supposed to work. So this is an illustration of wreckers at work. So how is supposed to situation supposed to work? So there's a ship that's that's foundered or or wrecked, and it's close enough to shore that it can be reached. Um, this is a generalization because this operates a little different in different uh, uh, parts of the world, which we'll get to later. But basically, whoever gets there first is the wreck master and gets to be in charge of coordinating the salvage. Um, that person obviously gets a slyer, slightly higher take of, of, of whatever is salvaged. Um, so it's the wreck master's job to, to organize resources. Now, I'll give you an example. You had a really big ship like that that was that was that was run up on a sandbar um the way that, that you might have to the wreck master might have to deal with that is, is first they would need to have enough ships that could actually take all the cargo off and and be able to put it someplace where it could be um taken to an admiralty court um but that wasn't often enough to get the ship off the bar what they would then do is, you know, and this was what they did for a living, this was the extras. They would have the larger kind of wreckers boats that have tap stands. Those are the winches for raising and lowering anchors. And they would tie, they might have five, six of these sloops with cap stands, all stern anchored, and then run five, six lines to that ship and five, six cap stands in one. Heave! And that's how they would <clears throat> wrench that ship off of the bar, back afloat, Take the whole thing to Admiralty Court, let a judge sort it out. Um, so that's not supposed to work. The value of salvage, uh, salvage is determined by the court. It's divided up against all the different parties. There's a lot of different people involved in this. There could be a person who owns the ship who uh, has nothing to do with this particular uh, cargo. So there's a person who owns the cargo. Sometimes there's a, a cargo master involved. Um, the, the, the ships are insured. Um, so you have insurance companies involved. Um, there are a lot of different parties, and that's one of the reasons why it's a little more complex than people think it's going to be. Um, anyway, uh, over the years, um, the wreckers in different parts of the world, particularly in, most, uh, in, in England and in particular Cornwall, um, you started to see these accusations start to come up, um, and three accusations seem to come up all the time. And they're pretty heinous. The first was inducements. The notion that these people who lived along the shore would put up false lights that would lure a ship into a place where there wasn't a port, but there were reefs, rocks, or sandbars, or whatever. Um, one historian reviewed every case of, in the Admiralty Court during the era of sail, and not one captain that was brought before the Key West Admiralty Court ever claimed that they had been uh, tricked into a wreck by wreckers. So right now, there's no evidence that this actually ever happened anywhere. There's a place in the Outer Banks of Carolina called Nags Head that some people insist was because they would hang lanterns around the, the, the horses necks and that would trick a ship into thinking that they were near port. And I'm sorry, you know how far, how close to shore you have to be to see a lantern that's hanging around a ship? It's like, you, if you're that close to see that, you were already screwed. Um, <laughs> no. So the second one, Failure to assist survivors. Now, uh, this is actually um, uh, even worse. The idea, apparently, there was, a, there, was a, there, were, there was a law, or at least people believed in, there was a law in England that said that if you came across a ship and there was not a single soul on it alive, you can keep it and everything on board, no questions asked. But if there was so much as a single living survivor on that ship, the whole thing Got to be taken to Admiralty Court. Well, now you can kind of see, um, you know, uh, uh, it didn't take long for uh, people to sort of leap to the assumption that uh, people were being murdered or whatever. But once again, it's, it's there just isn't any evidence that that, that actually happened. Now, you know, there's stories because there's a lot of fiction about wreckers. And the fiction, as you can imagine, go, goes to terrible places. Um, and then the last was, of course, the whole purpose of all this was the plundering of the cargo. And, ah, okay, <laughs> this probably happened a lot. Um, but 
let's 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 uh, uh, let's be let's be clear here. It's April twenty twenty four. Um, I'll have to ask this question: Who here thinks they got a real good handle on the legalities and limits of finders keepers? Okay. Now we all know. Hey, there's a dollar. Pick it up, keep it. No questions asked. Five dollars, nice. Ten dollars, hundred dollars. What's a thousand dollars? At what point do you say, now wait a minute? How much am I allowed to just keep with the no questions asked? Because I think there's a number out there where I can go from, you know, just stumbling upon something. And if I keep it, I'm a criminal. Anybody here know what that number is? That's what I'm saying. If we don't have a handle on that in the current era, what are the chances that people in these far flung communities who are often illiterate, uneducated, that they were going to have a keen notion of what they could keep that was okay, what they had to just oh, we might get in trouble. So um, when we say plundering of cargo, you know, it not, we don't really know that it ever rose to the level of the accusations, but people were going to walk off with stuff. And as we will find out, they weren't necessarily breaking the law. So uh, one of the things we've been doing at Mama Timeline, um, it, it is a stark realization that um, so many of the greatest stories from our past have no art whatsoever, no illustration. And um, so we do what, what publishers do. We started hiring artists. So we uh, created the first illustration of Joshua Huddy when he was captured by Colonel Ty in Colts Neck. And I think we've done 10 of these now. In fact, we are delighted we have a artist in the back of the room as a guest, Steve Schreiber, who did the Middletown Militia secures their prize painting last year, which is uh, outstanding and is on display at the Middletown Library. Um, and this was done by Charlie Swordlow. And it's, it's, it's the same, it's titles the same as this presentation. It's called Wreckers, the uh, 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 um, Land Pirates of Barnegat. And this is, this is supposed to show what it would be like if all those heinous accusations were true, okay? So inducement, right? So that's why that ship wrecked, because that bonfire made them think that they were at uh, maybe the, you know, Barnegat Inlet, not a couple miles uh, south or north of there. Survivors, right? There they are being beaten off, you know, <laughs> not being allowed to reach shore. It's pretty gruesome, isn't it? It's, these, are, these are horrible accusations to make. And then the cargo and... That's, that's pretty much everything you see on the beach there is the, is the goods on that ship being swept away. Um, don't you think if this kind of thing actually really happened, we'd know a little more about it? Well, anyway, um, so this is, a, this is a situation that exists in uh, a lot of different places, but um, the records in the original colonies, each one has a slightly different dynamic. Um, and uh, so Sable Island, Canada, that's up in the St. George's fishing banks between it's fog and wind. Um, I think there's over 350 shipwrecks um, that, that are in that area documented. Uh, Boston and, and Cape Cod. Now, that, Boston, it's like, that's why they had to make the Cape Cod Canal because it was so treacherous to get from Boston around Provincetown past those islands because it was tempted to go inside those islands where the water was nice and calm. That's where the rocks of Woods Hole are. My family was in the boatyard business in Falmouth, and sailors who thought that they could go through Woods Hole by a sail were our sole, major source of, of revenue. Um, and, and these are people with full electronics, you know, engines. And uh, anyway, uh, Sandy Hook and the entrances to New York Harbor. And the reason I say Sandy Hook and not Long Island or any of those other things is you'll see in a moment. Uh, the Outer Banks. And the Straits of Flora and the Caribbean, uh, essentially um, uh, ships that were uh, taking treasure from the Spanish main had to either navigate through those island chains or they had to go uh, north of, of uh, Cuba and south of Havana. Those are both deadly, deadly waterways with uh, hidden rocks that have names the way uh, uh, whitewater uh, rivers have, the rapids have names like Raft Ripper and Widowmaker. So there's all the, uh, so these are, these are all places that ships wreck all the time. And that's why each of these places has um, wreckers. Now the wreckers in the Caribbean, they're all mostly based out of, uh, out of what was then called Providence, uh, the capital of the Bahamas. Uh, but there were Native Americans who were some of the first wreckers. And the Mer Native Americans were free divers. So they were just people who would hold their breath, dive down and come back with some gold from a Spanish ship. 
Um, again, that's why that logging thing is that like, because they would pass, of course they passed laws to say you couldn't do that after all. But, so why was the, why was, why is our area so dangerous? Why are there, you know, the numbers vary, 1200 shipwrecks, depending on how far south you want to go. But, but our little region is phenomenally dangerous for shipwrecks and always has been because of the geography. So it, it, at, at the top there, leading up to the letter E, that's the Hudson River. And of course the Hudson River is not a river. Uh, because it was carved by a fjord. And you can see that that glacial activity creates the deep water channel that goes all the way out to the ocean, right? But look where it goes. It goes right hard by the tip of Sandy Hook. Let's take a closer look, right? So there's Sandy Hook at the bottom. And you see there's the main channel, the Gedney Channel, Swash Channel. Those were the only ways in and out of Manhattan, right? And look how close that goes to Sandy Hook. Now, once you're on the other side of the bar, as they called it, you're in a very safe harbor. You're one of the safest natural deep water, water uh, ports in the whole world. But if you get blown off, of course, in either direction, there's a really good chance of wrecking, right? And oftentimes, some of these channels would, might have a shipwreck get in it. And so now you, you have a channel that's blocked. This is the, why the critical importance of, of uh, pilots, local ship pilots, became more and more important over the decades um, because <clears throat> you just couldn't know wh what the right way to get over past the bar was in those days without a local expert. Now, this is a current map. And what this is what interesting is here. Interesting, so you can see there where the dredged uh, uh, ship can, uh, is, uh, uh, channel is. But there's the same deep water channel. still goes right by Sandy Hook. And we all know Sandy Hook has been growing for, for as long as uh, uh, there have been settlers here. Uh, that's why the lighthouse isn't close to the shore. And so what's interesting is that even though Sandy Hook keeps growing, there's still that deep water channel that just runs right off the tip of it. Um, and then there's this. Um, this is Horseshoe Island. This didn't exist 10 years ago. And it's off of, it's, it, came, it just popped up off of LBI. So it was, it, was a, it was a sandbar, then a bigger sandbar, and then a kind of a you know, it's a, the people go camping there now, it, it, and it's it, in its own way, it's so dangerous that they had they had to um, block people from going there. But that's off of LBI. That happens all the time in nature, where and, and, and you know, I mean, less often now with all the development and dredging and all that. But uh, uh, you know, you you might bring your ship into port um, and have no problems this year, and next year that's there that wasn't there before. It's not on your map. Um, and so again, this is this is the sort of thing that made our area so shipwreck prone. I'm sorry, but you're, this is Captain Negwitz. Does it line up with Beach Haven or Beach Haven? Uh, where, where what's that? Oh, oh um, 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 it's just off Tuckerton Inlet. Yeah. Um, so how did so where did this bad reputation come from? You know the heinous accusations. You take a look at newspaper coverage. Now what I did was I actually looked at every single newspaper in the, uh, in, uh, the three online archives, uh, and I read every story that mentioned records. And then I tracked them for whether they were <clears throat> positive, negative, or neutral. Well, the vast majority are neutral. Um, this is an example of a neutral story. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. Um, the idea is you know, that <clears throat> the master of the ship uh, was up on the reef at the Grand Caicos, uh, and in the morning saw 15 sail of wreckers to whom he rode off in the boat, offered him half his vessel, but they told him they never assisted anybody. So this is a negative story. And it's a negative story because um, it, 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 what almost all the negative stories have in common is a survivor, um, a, typically a captain, who's not really happy that he has to deal with these wreckers. And so they try to negotiate when they have nothing to negotiate with. You know, your, ship is, your ship is foundered. You, know, you, got, you, can't, you are helpless. These people can help. You don't get to say, well, how about if we just say half? It's like, well, how about if we do nothing and you, and you die here, you know, and we come back after you. Like, so it, it, these, a lot of these exchanges, when there was a captain who survived, came back, he would tell a story that didn't exactly portray these rescuers in the most positive light. Um, but uh, so, you know, they, this is actually a very long story for the time. Um, all right, so then, so this is a, this is a positive story, okay? Um, the the Stonewinian trader was uh, up on a rock, reek of rocks, with a captain, passage, and crew happily 
got offshore and were treated with great humanity by some wreckers who after them carried them to Providence. Now that's a positive story, right? Great humanity. Now, <clears throat> this is the earliest story about wreckers in New Jersey I could find. Um, and uh, um, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, 1816. And um, uh, this, is, this is a firsthand account of a crew member who was on board a ship that ran onto a sandbar off Cape May. And some locals came to provide assistance. And um, the sea is every exertion was made to bring them out. Let's say our endeavors would have been fruitless, but for the courageous and enterprising exertions of a few persons who assisted us from shore. Every possible means is using to preserve what may be got from the wreck. Now, that's pretty positive. Now, Maryland Gazette, same day, another firsthand account from a different crew member on that same ship. Okay, this one's long. Well, I was not going to try and do it all, but we'll cut to the chase here. As the lives of the men were my only object, I can say little about the cargo. I saw the wreck master with a gang of hands, busily employed, and had many bales of goods entire, already secured. And as he is a vigilant man, there is not much danger, but such goods as come ashore will be principally saved. So, right? Now, this is a positive, this is a positive story. There's two firsthand accounts that are positive. Okay? Now, the third one comes about two weeks later in Philadelphia. And it's the same story up to a certain point. And then there's a little bit that's been tacked onto it. The conduct of the part of the people of Cape May County has been the most infamous in plundering and carrying off the goods that were washed ashore. A lady who was drowned and whose body came on shore was stripped of her watch, necklace, and other trinkets. And the amount of goods stolen probably amounts to $20,000. 170 packages of silks, broadcloths, china, and other valuable goods were all that is saved in a few weeks. Cape May and Egg Harbor. <clears throat> Will, will, uh, will shine with silks, ribbons, and ostrich feathers, the property of persons in New York and Philadelphia. Uh, the collector appears to be an honorable, correct man. Would that the same could be said about the records. Where did that come from? The two crew members who said everything that happened with the people on shore was humane and positive and, and, and done with integrity. And then another newspaper, not quoting any source, right? Not quoting any source, now tells a completely opposite story. Now these people are scoundrels. Are they the worst scoundrels on the face of the earth yet? Wait and see. Um, but this is one of the reasons it's so critical that if anyone's ever doing historical research that you can't just ever take one newspaper story and say, that's the fact. Um, it, it, because this is, you know, if this was the only story you read, would you think you actually had an accurate view of what happened? So um, that's why it's so important to look at, as, at everything you can, as tedious and time-consuming as that can be. Uh, yes, Cape May County, most infamous in plundering. Um, right. Let's go on. Now, so where do this, these heinous accusations originated in England, and the newspaper coverage in England is 10 times worse than that story. Uh, uh, so here's a ship that uh, was so, so, and for what escaped the fury, the sort of fell a prey to the rapacity of the wreckers, who numerously infest many parts of the Cornish coast, watching the shipwrecks with the greatest eagerness, when instead of assisting the unfortunate mariners, they too often prevent their escape from a watery gave in order to plunder the property. This was, a, this was this, what, what you see in the UK a lot, is the slandering of the people of Cornwall, um, <clears throat> But without witnesses, or usually without even something specific, um, and it got it tended to get worse over time, where records became a metaphor for horrendous malfeasance and bad. But so uh, uh, corrupt stockbrokers, you know, there would be there would be stories in London newspapers about uh, the stockbrokers and who are as like the wreckers with no regard for anybody's life or property but their own, and who will induce people to you know uh, you know allow them to you know. It's like, you know all the time, without actually referencing records who have actually done something wrong. But like they never say, as like with the records of 1816, it's just like these records, this is what they do all the time. And it's just, so this kind of thing can take on a life of its own. And clearly, you know, as we know, um, and pretty much as English colonies, the things that happen in England come to the United States. And so newspapers in Philadelphia in particular, 
started using records as a metaphor for rapaciousness and all that. So in 1832, uh, there was a ship called, on uh, January 6th, 1832, uh, a ship called the George S. Canning, uh, uh, foundered on a sandbar um, outside off Barnegat. Uh, three other ships, uh, likewise, did the same over the next uh, 18 months. None of these are very important ships. They're not big ships. Um, uh, and uh, each one of those um, wrecks um, had, a, had a, an inch of newspaper coverage that would have that would went into the neutral category of news coverage of records, and then, in and then, two and then a year later, in one of the leading newspapers in New York City, on the front page, this headline: capture of land pirates. This is the longest story on record, by a factor of three hundred and fifty percent. Um, it goes into so much detail that we, we would spend two hours just on this story and we're not going to. Because um, why am I saying it's a hoax, right? I, I, I cut to the chase there, didn't I? Um, it very first appeared in the New York Gazette. By far the longest and, and most detailed story about records in the US. Copious details about these inlets, names of famous people, local residents, government leaders. It's detailed. All three of those heinous accusations, it was picked up by a number of other newspapers. So it was probably picked up by maybe 25 or 26 other newspapers. That was standard procedure back in the day. In the, at this time, uh, uh, the, news, the, the primary content of most newspapers was uh, content that had been previously published in other newspapers. Mark Twain wrote a short story on that called Journalism in Tennessee. It's one of the funniest things you'll ever read about would be um, what it was like uh, for newspapers to, you know, to republish other people's work and how they didn't often like it. Um, at any rate, uh, so, you know, it had, it, it, it was a story that had some legs, um, but no major publications. The New York Times doesn't touch it. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the big, major, legitimate publications don't touch it. And then it fades fairly quickly. That story doesn't seem like it should have faded at all, um, but it did. So why, again, why do we think it's a hoax? Well, we'll take a look at some of the details. Um, yeah, only about 20 papers chose to run the story, uh, ignored by the big city outlets and every newspaper in New Jersey. Not one newspaper in New Jersey thought that story was worth picking up. But, but how does that seem possible? Was there, there wasn't that much more interesting stuff going on than the fact that, uh, by the way, in that story, so it applies that two thirds of the entire village of Barnegat complicit in the piracy, murder, and um, uh, 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 plundering. That there were twenty some ships that were that were at anchor um, in uh, in the harbor. Um, but when the insurance agent that was sent by the New York judge showed up in town, all twenty uh, 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 heaved anchor and, and and sailed up, never to be heard from again. Um, the, the wreck master fled to Indiana, where he was tracked down and arrested and brought back and put on trial. Um, and uh, oh, it wasn't the wreck master, he was the, he was, um, he was the, he was the ringleader who was the, who was the justice of the peace and this all this other stuff, William Platt. And um, uh, so on and on and on with, the, with, these kinds of, with these kinds of accusations. But none of that was picked up by any of the other New Jersey newspapers. So, um, now, it's also important to remember what newspapers were like during this time. This is a period, you know, they were, they were called the Penny Press um, and, and they were entertainment. They were one of the leading forms of entertainment. They were a long ways away from where they were trying to present themselves as the beacons of, of truth and, and, and factual uh, relaying of news. And so that's why these, these newspapers had uh, stories, poems, and um, a, a lot of completely made up stuff. Um, and, and that was commonplace and that was true of almost every one of them. Newspaper hoaxes, fairly common in that era, okay? And the two of my favorites, 1835, right? That exact same time, uh, the, the New York Sun started publishing a series of stories about a colony of people on the moon. And uh, everybody just ate it up alive. Um, and, uh, and then, oh, it's a little later than our story. It's still one of my favorites that in 1864, the publisher of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle arranged to have a forged Associated Press announcement that was circulated to all the New York papers, ostensibly from the White House, 
in which President Abraham Lincoln apologized for his inability to be the man who was up to the challenges that he was facing. Um, once again, most of the legitimate outlets recognized it for um, the forgery it was, but it got picked up by enough places that it triggered a stock market panic, which was the whole point, and that, none of that was even illegal. So you could, if you got a newspaper, you could do almost anything you wanted. So here are a few details that, don't, add, that just don't hold water. So the judge, Betts, um, who orders this uh, insurance agent, who only has one name, he's, his name is just Huntington, he doesn't have a first name, or maybe Huntington was his first name. Um, this, is, this is no different than the system of uh, the, the federal circuit courts we have today. Um, you have a New York judge who deals with New York matters, New Jersey matters are handled by New Jersey judges. That's the whole point of the system. So a New York judge doesn't send an investigator into New Jersey to deal with a crime that happened in New Jersey. Garrett Wall, a very famous New Jersey resident, and he was, in fact, New Jersey state attorney at one time, but that was yet to come. But it wasn't at that time. William Platt wasn't any... There was a guy named William Platt who shows up for a newspaper story as having been... Uh, uh, had, having had a um, warrant for his arrest because um, he had fled the county. And if he had fled the county to avoid divorce proceedings. And, uh, so, and, and you know, so yes, there was a William Platt. Yes, there was a guy who, by that name who got in some trouble with the law. Um, nothing to do with any of this stuff. So it's like the whole thing, you start picking apart every fact that's claimed in this story, almost none of them hold water. Yeah, he wasn't arrested. <laughs> yeah. um, so, and again, you know, all the official records that should be there, there were no arrests, no trials, right? There's, there's, there, there's no incarcerations. There's, it, it's like, it's just, poof. All those things happened and nobody cared that went away. That's why I, 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 um, I believe it's a hoax. And then uh, there's a whole bunch of specific names that are mentioned that just can't be verified anywhere else. Now, I haven't done, I haven't taken that to the, ninth level, which I intend to do, but you know, which is that's like start taking some of those lists of names and going through census records and, and, and casting a wider net. This is a story that I want to keep researching um, because uh, the ultimate um, uh, question is um, why? But the other thing is, and this is what people don't expect, is that all these allegations are refuted by official documents. So who did it and why? Well, selling newspapers, that's why that was the whole colony on the moon thing. The sun was one of the lesser known papers and that rocketed them to the top um, uh, insurance fraud. Okay. Insurance fraud happened all the time. Fairly, very common thing. What if the reason that not all that cargo that was on those four ships made it back into the hands of their owners was because that cargo wasn't on the ship in the first place it was a falsified manifest and how convenient that the locals all ran away with it. OK, um, no evidence to, to support that, but it holds a little bit of water. Revenge? I can't figure out why. This is a really serious slandering of Barnegat. It's a small town. Ooh, what, what, could have, what kind of bad experience could anyone have had at Barnegat where they would have said, you know what? Get them back. You wait and see. You wait and see. Um, and then this one, OK, to improve America's, bear with me here. Okay, it's, it's 1834. We are still not very far away from the War of 1812. America has only been on its own, fully independent for a fairly short period of time. And we do not have a good reputation um, with the uh, leaders of the civilized world elsewhere. Uh, America is considered a backwater, unrefined, you know, place of uh, uh, losers. And um, uh, the, the civic leaders of, of America are very aware of this, and they're doing a lot of different things to burnish America's reputation in a lot of different ways. So that's why over, it's over this kind of period, the next couple of decades, you know, you start to see America's um, um, uh, past heroes um, uh, elevated to icon level. So all of a sudden, George Washington can't tell a lie and chop down a cherry tree. Well, that, that stuff comes written so far after his death, at, but it's at a time when America wanted to show that, that you know, they had, uh, um, you know, incredible leaders who were as uh, on a par with the great leaders of the other uh, major countries of the world. I, 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 who knows? I don't know. But at any rate, so 
If it seems like this old business of records is chaotic and anarchistic, you're half right. It is definitely chaos, but it's not anarchy. Um, New Jersey state legislature passed a law called an act concerning Rex in 1799. That law was amended at least six different times. And that law set forth requirements that every county in New Jersey that was facing either the Delaware River or the ocean had to hire a master of wrecks, somebody who would be paid to ensure that if there were ships that wrecked close to shore, proper resources were marshaled and every bad possible effort was made uh, to um, uh, 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 assist and, and, and uh, render the best salvage possible. Um, uh, he, he, he doesn't have any equipment, he doesn't have any money, and he can't actually force people to help him if they don't feel like it. So it's better than nothing. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence to show that, that Foreman and, and his colleagues uh, uh, over and over again risked their lives under harrowing conditions to try and save uh, 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 rescue ships. And um, you know, what they got for their trouble was being slandered. But uh, Monmouth County Historical Association still has John Foreman's records. And they tell fascinating stories. And they're not stories of plundering and pillaging. Um, so we'll take a look at, uh, so Mama County, just Mama County had five rec masters. Um, Foreman served for more than 30 years. Uh, it was one of many hats. Um, and this was typical of a lot of the other people who were rec masters and similarly, they would, would be those kind of people. Um, his father was a rec master before him. His son was a rec master after him and he kept meticulous records. That's an important part of the job. So remember I told you four ships were involved in that uh, Barnegat, right? And the, 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 it was the James Fisher, Henry Franklin, George Canning, and the General Putnam, okay? This is one of the four ships in the hoax story. Supposedly the locals ran off with everything. Well, here's an accounting of everything that was taken off that ship and returned to the insurers or the owners. Copious details, five casts, one cast, one cast, you know, and off to the left, you see people's marks where they weren't, they didn't use signatures in those days. So you see people's marks, uh, you know, packages. And so um, General Putnam accounts book with the uh, employees. Are, so they had to pay all the volunteers that showed up to help. And so that had to have an accounting. Who showed up? What do they do? How much is owed? Um, this particular here, the, 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 the crew that survived from the General Putnam, well, that's great. You survived, but where are you going to go now? There's no hotels. There's some taverns, but hardly any on the coast at that time. So the county, Monmouth County, pays for these guys to be taken to uh, Perth Amboy and put up in a tavern. And there's a cost associated. So here you see, the costs associated with uh, taking William out to the Amboy for room and lodging, $18.50 was a lot of money in those days. So the county was racking up a lot of money here. Um, and uh, <clears throat> this is uh, one of three letters in the files that are from insurers, okay? And uh, because uh, the rec master uh, uh, position was an appointment, uh, it would come up for renewal periodically. So this is an insurance agent in New York writing uh, to the judge in Monmouth County, uh, exhorting him to reappoint John Foreman, saying he might be the most honest person I've ever met. He single-handedly has helped save $100,000 of worth of our insured cargo. Holy moly, that's a lot of money. So, you know, this is, this is, this is what these people were doing, um, but most of these records don't exist anymore. And so that's one of the reasons it's easy to just, you know, make up stories about them. Um, so... Now we're in a period of time where that the hoax story has, has, has faded away. But um, this is a period where, you know, there's now a pop cultural fascination with records. So there are now uh, uh, novels about records, plays about records, poems about records. Do you, think there, do you think any of them are following the neutral narrative or the positive narrative? Oh, no. They're all, you know, there's the false lights and... You know, uh, it, uh, it, 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 so they, they and they, they obviously exaggerate things to um, uh, uh, incredible levels. So this is the situation that persists when we get to, uh, the, this is a very famous wreck. 
And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it um, because earlier, well, maybe this year, yeah, this year, last year, um, Bernadette Rogoff at MCHA uh, did a, a, a talk that's on their YouTube channel um, where they did a very deep dive into the John Minturn wreck, including the wreck master who responded to that. Uh, so John Foreman would have been in the supporting role here. Um, but this, and just to remind everybody, 1846, there's a huge storm, uh, 10 shipwrecks. Um, I mean, there were, I think there was way more in time, 10 just between Sandy Hook and Barnegat. Uh, some of them were intentional groundings. Um, and, um, you know, the, but, but some of them were, in, like the John Minturn, involved horrible loss of life. And it, it was national news, international news, um, and, and the nation was really uh, outraged that, uh, um, and again, the, the, the Minturn is another one of these situations, like, like what you saw in the, uh, the, the art uh, work, where the people who are on board the ship have a very different perspective than the people on land. The people on land, it's February. You want to get in the water in February in a major storm and row out to help some people you don't know? Uh, you know, um, well, nobody did that day. Um, and about, but the people on the ship think, well, you guys should just be a little braver. It's not, it's not that bad. Come on, help us out. So you have the, you know, the survivors afterwards are saying horrible things about the people on land. Um, because they felt like they should have, you know, just um, been more willing to commit suicide uh, on their behalf. Um, and, um, <clears throat> but uh, by the way, in those 10 wrecks, for each of the John Minturn, where they weren't able to save anybody, there were at least two occasions where wreck masters and locals did respond and save uh, like almost entire passenger crew from, from some of those wrecks. So like two of those 10 wrecks had really good outcomes. Two of them had really horrible outcomes and the rest were sort of in between. But it made a lot of news uh, and, and, and um, it really sort of provoked a lot of people to try and do something. And here come the New York newspapers again. Guess what? Coast piracies, the Barnegat pirates. Oh, come on, really? There'd be land rats and water rats, land thieves and water thieves. I mean, that's Shakespeare from Merchant of Venice. Um, for year, many years prior to 1835, well, wait a minute, in 1834, it was only happened for two years, but uh, the, the Barney District, known for the piratical propensities of Squire Platt. There's Platt, poor William Platt. What a, what, you know, this, this guy's out there saying, what do I do? The director said his boon companions, the parson, the doctor, the fisherman. Anyway, um, a lot of newspapers picked that up um, and uh, it, it, people in the state government in Trenton had finally had enough. And that's where Alexander Wurtz uh, uh, made that statement that the people of the coast are either the worst scoundrels on the face of the earth, or they are a much injured set of men. So um, uh, what Wurtz did was he challenged the governor to do something about it. And the governor did. The governor initiated a, um, an investigative uh, committee that went down to Sandy Hook the next day to start interviewing survivors. And uh, this is why we believe that all of the wreckmaster papers from the Minturn are missing because they would have been swept up in that investigation. And we just like to think that somewhere out there, maybe in Trenton, there's a box that someone hasn't opened yet, right? This is the historian to what, um, and, uh, and there'll be all the Minturn, missing Minturn papers. But um, uh, uh, anyway, the, the, um, the committee interviewed, had held these hearings and, and the word got out and uh, people made um, lo a lot of effort to, uh, to you know, some of the surviving captains that are still in the area still are trying to, uh, you know, made an effort to uh, um, go and make sure that their statements were, were part of this investigation. Um, uh, and uh, yes, Charles S. Stratton. Um, they meet in Freehold, they toured the site. And then, uh, <clears throat> so this is the, well, this is the only surviving paper from the John Minturn, the direct master file of John Foreman. Doesn't say much of anything, uh, but it does prove, you see, February 27th, 1846. So um, this, is, this is what their conclusion is. We therefore report to your excellency the charges in the resolution under which we act are accordingly to the best of our own judgment upon the evidence, each and every one of them untrue. That there are no inhuman and guilty actors therein to be punished and that the state ought to be released from the odium of such barbarity. 
So it is around this time that this is, a, this is where we get into the more familiar part of our history, that a local doctor named William Newell was so outraged at what he saw by the lack of a coordinated, effective response to these shipwrecks. They ran for Congress, got elected, and then managed to put and in, uh, insert into an appropriations bill, a line item for $10,000 uh, to provide life-saving equipment um, for uh, uh, Monmouth County. Um, not, some people like to call this the Newell Act. Um, it's not an act. It is, it is not an act of Congress. It is simply one single line in a long appropriations bill that has a whole bunch of other bits of cash. We call it pork today. Um, but at any rate, that was $10,000. And that, that was all there was to um, try and assist um, with what the rec masters were doing. And as we know, it was, not, it, it was effective a little bit at first, but the equipment did, you know, needed maintenance that they didn't have. They, the people needed training, which they weren't having. They, the, the men still weren't being paid and given incentives to do this. So it, it didn't work as well as it was supposed to. And so that's how eventually... It morphed into uh, you know, the, the U.S. Life Saving Service as a federal uh, uh, organization. And eventually the Life Saving Service was merged together with the Life Keeper Service and the uh, Revenue Cutters. Um, and uh, so, uh, what there? okay, so, uh, so, yeah, so the demise of wreckers is, starts also with the fact that once you start having commercial uh, vessels that are powered by engines, not sails, you just have less racks. Because these are ships that have much greater ability uh, to avoid trouble, uh, to, to, to stay out of, you know, to, to, to not be blown off course in a storm. So th that evolution made a huge difference. Um, uh, the improvements in lighthouses and charts and all that. Technology, that's an old Loran C. That half the people in this room probably knew that. And then, you know, the, the U.S. Coast Guard finally. Um, and uh, so, you know, the Coast Guard is now the, uh, the entity that handles um, all marine rescue. Uh, marine salvage is now handled by private um, contractors. So we'd still have wreckers. We absolutely do. And then there's a TV show about them. I don't know, I don't know if it's still on or not. Um, I, if it's a reality show, there's probably not much reality to it. Um, but, um, but yes, there are, yeah. You know, and they're, they're much more, they're much like the wreckers who respond when your car breaks down. They're a very similar kind of thing. Um, and uh, they don't, they, they are not considered murderers and corpse robbers these days. Um, so the legacy um, of wreckers, besides obviously the Coast Guard, is like, um, we had wreckers in this area. That's a fact of life. But most of the pirate stories in our area are pure mythology. But we believe the pirate stories and we will adopt something that was never here as our school symbol. That, by the way, can I get into that school with a knife in my teeth or does that set off the metal detectors? I mean, do you know how, what the awful things real pirates did, yeah. right? I mean, you name it, it you talk about heinous crimes. And um, so talk about, a, it's like, well, that should be the wreckers. The Red Bank Regional Records. First, it's gender neutral. Um, <laughs> and it sounds like a good sports team, doesn't it? Now, wreckers are coming to town. Oh, boy, did, did Baptist, you know, did, did Asbury Park got wrecked again by, the, you know. Um, anyway, I, I think I'm all alone in this case. Um, but at any rate, uh, once again, uh, in Barnegat, they love their pirates, even though they never had any. Uh, but they don't adopt their wreckers, even though they should. Um, and so... That's my presentation. Captain. A very mild correction, forgive me, you've been exhausted research on this. I used to be a journalist. So the Oaks family founded the Times in 1851. Oh, okay. So it wasn't so even they, there yet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They yes. have yeah. That yeah. No, you're so right. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so, okay. I knew figured Wall Township is not named for, you know, like Wall Street, New York City for an actual right. wall. I wondered, you know, a predecessor of his. It's, a, it's a, oh, yeah. Older, yeah, that family. So the question, 
there was, first of all, um, there was a, a correction that's completely appropriate. I think I mentioned that the New York Times didn't pick it up. And, it, and it, I'm, I'm in correct in that the New York Times did not exist at that time. So they had a good reason for not getting involved with it. But the, the point I was making was that all of the other leading legitimate newspapers in New York did not cover it. And not a single paper in New Jersey. Which hurts which, the cause of uh, and uh, and so the question was uh, the reference to Garrett Wall um, was uh, uh, is is that um, either the person uh, or the family for whom Wall Township is named and not the, it is it is not the person but it is the family. Anything else? What else? Well, Blackbeard anchored off off uh, Cape May. That's my next thing I'm doing. I'm working on a Blackbeard story right now. See, there's a bunch of things going on here. First of all, there's a lot of people who will conflate privateers with pirates, okay? So sometimes when people say pirates, they're referring to privateers. Um, and because, uh, you know, there's not a lot of evidence. For example, the, the, whole, the Captain Kidd story doesn't, doesn't hold water if you just look at when he was here and when the settlers were here, you know, supposedly the richest man in New York was going to get in his ship, leave Manhattan, come across Raritan Bay, anchor off Ideal Beach to get groceries? <laughs> when there had only been people living here for 30 years? Doesn't make sense at all. They didn't have anything to trade. They were still in sustenance farming. They were trying to feed themselves. They didn't have anything to sell. They, they were trading amongst themselves to stay alive. So, uh, yeah, most of the pirates, so it, when they talk about the pirates of um, Little Egg Harbor, those are privateers. Those are not. Those are not pirates. Yes. Oh. Uh, almost, almost certainly. Say that again. I lot, yeah. Oh yeah. Right. Well, again, that was an accusation that was it was everywhere in the British colonies, but nobody ever, ever, ever brought a case to Admiralty Court. If you were if you were a ship captain and you wrecked your ship because somebody duped you, wouldn't you be yelling loud and about that? Hey, hey, hey! You know, somebody. I thought I was at the entrance to the. You know, no one ever did. So, uh, and and uh, plus, no one was going to. Uh, uh, that was that was not a. That was not a, anyway. I I I I, I just I, I, the question was uh, um, did, did, were there there's a, a law that, that prohibited people from putting up false lights. They may have just passed that law um, because there was the, the rumor of false lights. Uh, but at any rate, I, it, there is there is still no evidence that that actually happened. You didn't want to admit they were I'm sorry. Maybe the captain didn't want to admit. But uh, yes, so the question is, when he might the captain didn't want to admit he was duped? Sure, but not one of them. I mean, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. We'll see. All right, that's why that's why we our, our artist used a, a major bonfire because even with a good telescope, I mean, the whole point of going up the coast is to stay a pretty far safe distance, um, and. You know, not a lot of people are, you know, the vast majority of the traffic is going to Baltimore and Philadelphia and New York and Boston. It's not going into Ocracoke. It's not going into, uh, not even, you know, the, even the chess, well, to Baltimore. But, um, you know, the, it's, the, so it's like, you know, these are not, these are hard. These are not, uh, it's like there are major lighthouses at these ports, at all these ports of entry. And, um, and again, you, you, the, the, the system of pilotage, it's like you can, so, it, it, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's uh, the, the, the do part is, um, I still think that, that they, uh, somebody would have admitted that at one point, but. Uh, uh, so, uh, writers and journalists keep confused, do not understand that people have a right to run out from Barnegat and negotiate percentages, splits, or they rescue them, they go. Uh, so, the yeah. Or, yeah, so the, qu the qu question is impossible that new, yeah, it's impossible that qu newspaper uh, writers simply did not understand that the system of how the system of marine salvage operated and that these were legitimate people that were performing uh, tasks as proscribed by state law. Um, it's hard to believe um, because, uh, because it was a law that was amended in, 
six times. So this is a this is a thing that's happening uh, uh, periodically. Um, it's constantly changing rates or whatever. Um, and uh, they didn't cover a lot of legislative stuff in the newspapers as much as they did. Um, but it's also because that this system had been around for hundreds of years. Um, and that, yeah, it's a little hard to swallow that they would be that naive. Correct. Well, she, I mean, uh, 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 in those days, shipping news was what, the most important news because everything came by ships. The people you're waiting for are out there on a ship. The stuff you bought is coming in on a ship. Uh, you know, uh, the people you, the, you know, somebody you love just left on a ship and you don't know when they're coming back. So, you know, the shipping news, and that's why it's a little, it's in those days, the shipping was such a huge, important focus of everybody. That I, that's why it's a little hard to believe that newspapers would be like, what? Those people, those, those are hired employees. Hang on a second, let me get this. Yes, sir. Um, what was chronicle of this time, Cape Cod? It is, uh, he was able to survive because they said there was so much jet ski on the beach uh, and an occasional dead body that he was able to get by. And it wasn't just him, but there were other beach comers. They were able to be rather comfortable yeah. on Washington shore. So they said there was an awful lot of shipwreckers and an awful lot of still. Um, uh, this is a, a comment by a member of the audience that Henry David Thoreau uh, at one point in his life uh, did not make a lot of money and was on Cape Cod where he was able to um, su provide subsistence by beachcombing and finding valuables that had washed up on shore that include things that he could eat and whatever. So, um, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> well, now, oh boy, yeah, in were people who would um, knock your house down, um, literally knock your house down, um, so that they could basically steal it. Like, well, you don't, well, I don't see a house, do you see it? So, yeah, no, there's a Oh, this, yeah, the, the story of the house wreckers in, in Ireland is movie worthy. Question from yes, sir. Can you explain the difference between a pirate and a privateer? A, a privateer is a, a private ship that uh, signs a contract with a nation to serve as an extension of their navy during a time of war where this private ship will attack commercial vessels and potentially warships, but that didn't happen all that often. Uh, so England used privateers to, as an extension of the Navy against France and Spain. The United States used privateers extensively against the British in World War I, but especially in the War of 1812. Uh, at the start of the War of 1812, the United States Navy had eight ships. And, and, but they, they signed, they signed uh, the, um, these uh, local captains to what were called letters of mark that put forth rules so they are engaging in acts of piracy on a limited and restricted basis. Um, now, in the golden age of piracy, you had <clears throat> um, uh, privateers that were uh, uh, working for everybody against everybody. And then they eventually uh, signed treaties uh, that brought all that to an end. And boom, overnight, hundreds of battle-tested privateers are out of a job. Mark, my letter, yeah, Mark, the letter of Mark, Mark is spelled M-A-R-Q-U-E. So needless to say, a great number of the, the most famous pirates that we know of, Blackbeard, uh, Black Bart, Calico Jack Rackham, <clears throat> uh, Benjamin Hornigold, um, most of these people did come, uh, were, were privateers uh, who didn't have an ability to make money as a privateer and decided, well, we'll just keep doing what we were doing and uh, not be so restrictive about it. What's that? Was there a pirate honored by um, um, uh, Not a pirate, but uh, about Henry Morgan, the privateer. Yeah, yeah. The the, the privateer Henry Morgan um, 
uh, was one of the most um, aggressive and successful, but he, he, he stayed more or less within the rules and he stopped at the right time and was knighted. <laughs> and, 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 and held on to a lot of his money. With, so, yeah. <laughs> Sure, you mentioned the Cornish Coast. Well, actually, on my way here, I was trying to walk and read my phone. And the Make It In was the last film that Hitchcock made before he fled England in the United States. And it had Charles Lawton and um, Maureen O'Hara in their first season. And it's all about rappers, uh, terrible one. We love you, Brown, love you. Yeah, club right. you right on the club you at your shipwreck to make sure there were no spots. Well, that's why you saw that, that in the thing. You saw we had that in the thing. Yeah, people in the water would be club. But it's it was a that need to a novel that come out thirty three years early, and I don't know what her source material was. Apparently negative, but you know, yeah, and maybe just her imagination. But it was a thirty six novel by her and a thirty nine movie by Hitchcock, and my crummy Verizon. Uh, package that my roommate has we don't get turner classic movies which is unbelievable is but nice. i've seen it on there and you should look out for jamaica and i will absolutely You've seen, will. you have not seen it no i have not and charles lawton alone makes it for you <laughs> jamaica Inn. and apparently there's a real one jamaica well i'm going there i'm, like I'm going there i'm going there next month cornwall? yeah i'm going to cornwall next month and the sealy islands to, to continue my research on this Hold on. Mm -hmm. Being on, uh, yeah, I have, I, you know, the, uh, the events section is not up to date. I apologize. Hang on. There's it. It's, uh, the, or the website is monmouthtimeline.org. Um, here we go. Okay. Uh, I can see on Sunday day. And in my primary envelope is open. There is a lot of our times from the late on the Fort River and along the bay side. We used to go out and they would be paid to collect the dead bodies. And what they would do is dig them up again, bring them back to the beach, and bring them back uh -huh. out twice. Sort of, yeah. Believe me, believe me there, there, there's, there's, nobody is claiming that the standard human malfeasance happened in this regard. Uh, Okay. Still finalizing the details of the family. Uh, so stay tuned for our website. Uh, stay tuned for social media for that. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.